Um, so as you know, this research is focused on exploratory research, and we have this uh, <clears throat> you know, standardized survey that we've asked a, a lot of folks to, to fill out. But um, there's a lot that can't go into a standardized survey for obvious reasons, and that's why we're doing these interviews um, to try to get a little more depth and, and maybe some good stories uh, that will uh, liven up the, the text of our book and also maybe be, be fun and, and useful for people who might listen to the, to the blog uh, or, or read the interview online. Sounds like an awesome project. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're excited about it. And uh, again, really appreciate your, your uh, willingness to participate. Um, so, so I'll give you some questions, but you should feel free to, to answer them in any way you wish and, and dilate in, in any way you wish, because I'm sure there's some things that we haven't really thought of that, that you might want to, want to throw in. And, and the general, I guess the general idea is what, what can we say about this topic of exploratory research, which we define as everything that occurs before you settle on a specific research question, hypothesis and research design. Um, so it's the, you know, you might say the most dynamic creative part of, of research is what happens before that, that line is crossed. And my first question is about your approach. Is there a typical approach that you follow in identifying topics for research? Um, what, what seems to work best for you? Um, I think that really varies. Um, I guess I, I do a lot of text as data stuff. And so I think I'm often looking for interesting text data sets. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by interesting is often data sets that people have never looked at before that might, that I think might tell us something about longstanding questions that we've had in the discipline. Um, but because I think no one's ever looked at these data sets before, or sometimes they haven't really been explored, they, um, it does take quite a bit of exploratory research to figure out what they can even tell us um, or what can even be measured from them. Um, and so I think that that's sort of a complicated part of the process. Um, but often, I, I mean, you know, I study Chinese politics. Um, I'm interested in censorship, propaganda, but more broadly in, you know, state society relations in China. And um, so I'm, I'm always sort of have my ear to the ground for interesting data sets that reveal some of those interactions um, from social media data sets to, um, I'm, re I'm re working on a lot of right now on court data set, um, a court data set from China. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's, that's usually where I, I start looking. Great. Can, can you walk us through an example of, of how this has happened? Um, you know, where you, uh, where you discovered a new data set and what happened from there? Yeah. So um, one example is um, I was doing some work with Will Hobbs, uh, who's a former graduate student of, um, at UCSD and who's now assistant professor at Cornell. And we realized that there were a whole bunch of, Twitter posts geolocated to China. And this was very interesting because Twitter is blocked in China. So what were these Twitter posts geolocated to China? <laughs> you know, who were these people right. who were geolocated to China? And what could these tell us about, um, you know, how people were interacting with the internet? Um, and so we started to explore this data set and this led us into, um, a whole series of questions and a whole series of data sets that, um, that ended up in, in, um, in an article that we published in the APSR in, um, 2018. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that started with the discovery of something that you didn't initially think existed. Exactly. And it was puzzling that it even existed. Right. Um, and so, and, you know, we had no idea what, at first, I mean, it took a while. We did figure it out eventually, but um, at first we didn't really understand why it existed. Um, or especially because I thought that when people used a VPN to jump the Great Firewall, that they're, because they're um, masking their IP address or they're using a different IP to access Twitter, I thought that their geolocated posts would then geolocate to whatever location that they were using. 
But what I didn't realize was that um, actually most people were using VPNs on their phone and actually their GPS was geolocating them. So even though they were on a VPN, they were geolocating to China. And that was something I, I hadn't even realized. Mm-hmm. And, and how did you get from that to, um, you know, your, your research question and your hypothesis? Yeah. So then we started just trying to, we started just trying to understand this data, um, looking at the geography of the data, where were people geolocating, um, looking at um, what people were saying. Um, and one at one point we looked at a time series and we saw this huge spike in the number of posts, geolocated posts to China on a particular day. And that became very interesting. It's like, why all of a sudden were there so many people on Twitter in China on this day, which was September 29th of 2014. And, um, and so actually what we did is we decided just to read some of the posts from that day. And what became clear is that Instagram had been blocked on that day. And so we, it took us a while to kind of develop a theory of, wh- of why this might have generated more Twitter users when Instagram was blocked. But eventually we developed a theory and that had all of these observable implications for all of these other data sets that were not on Twitter. Um, so it had all of these, so if, if our theory is right, that means Instagram should look like this. That means Wikipedia should look like this. That means, and so we are able to then go and test that theory in all of these other data sets, um, on the internet. And that was, that was really cool. Um, mm-hmm. so just reading what people felt themselves, you know, on Twitter, just reading these tweets and everybody was like, you know, Instagram is blocked today. So I'm trying Twitter. <laughs> and, um, right. And, uh, or, you know, I downloaded a VPN and then now I'm on Twitter and that's how we kind of developed this theory of of what we call the gateway effect. Can can you explain that real, real briefly? Yeah. So it seems really counterintuitive that when Instagram is blocked, which is kind of an increase in censorship in some sense, that then all of these people would join Twitter, which has been blocked by the firewall since 2009. But what happened was that the great firewall was creating a friction between People in China who um, who um, didn't have a VPN and um, the websites that were blocked, right? So it made it a little bit harder to access those websites because you have to download a VPN to get them. So what happened on the day of the Instagram block is that everybody really wanted to stay on Instagram. And so even though it, the Instagram block decreased the overall usage of Instagram, all of these people downloaded a VPN on that day to get on Instagram. And then once they were over that friction, once they had jump the wall then they were able then they decided hey i'm already across the wall i'll get on twitter i'll get on facebook i'll get on wikipedia i'll get on all of these websites that have been blocked for a long time Mm -hmm. and so we call it a gateway effect because instagram had created when china blocked instagram it created this motivation to get across the wall and that was like kind of like a gateway drug or something to all of these other websites um, and, uh, and, and once we'd sort of like, originally we, we, you know, looked at the economics of crime literature and, and that gave us a, like a nice model to kind of model this out. And then we kind of saw in geolocated Instagram data in Wikipedia data, we saw this sort of happening on a, on a larger scale. Mm-hmm. Well, I, uh, this example is, is interesting because it illustrates, um, that, well, that there are many ways of coming up with ideas, right? And the traditional approach, which is I have a theory and now I have a hypothesis and now I look for data to test it, can sometimes be flipped, right? And you can start with the empirical material and that can lead you to a question and a theory. I think that's absolutely right. I actually, I think if we're honest with ourselves, or at least in my experience and in talking to a lot of people, um, you know, mostly we're drawing on some type of data to create a theory. So it might be quantitative data or it might be interviews or it might be, you know, our own intuition. But our intuition often comes from interaction with data mm-hmm. in, in some sense. <laughs> right. Um, and so I think, I think that documenting this process of discovery and separating it from testing, I think, is really important. Right. And now, do you feel bashful in saying that in public? 
Um, so we've been working a little bit on this, trying to sort of formalize this in the text world, because text is really high dimensional, kind of like our world, right? It's very high dimensional yeah. if you think about it that way. And you have to figure out how to measure concepts from text. And, um, and to, to do that, you have to interact with the data to decide on what concepts you want to measure. And so I think um, we just have to be honest that there, at, at some point we are interacting with the data to refine our measures. And then after that, we need kind of new data or, you know, in, to start over and do something and do a new experiment or something that then tests whatever theory we've come up with within that first step. So I, I think, I'm, I think it's completely, um, you know, I think if, if you discover as you're testing, that can be problematic. And I think a lot of people re- recognize that. But if you discover and then test, that seems to me to be, um, you know, uh, right. um, you, can, you can identify the, um, the effect without making your discovery part of your testing. <laughs> right, yeah. right, sure. So, so the key would be um, some kind of out-of-sample testing, I guess. But, yeah, so sort of drawing a line and saying, you know, now I'm going to test this on new data, I'm going to test this in another experiment. I'm going to, um, you know, make sure that my my discovery is not, um, you know, overfitting to, you know, I'm I'm not using discovery to overfit in, in a testing framework. Yeah. Right, right. So, so leaving aside this issue of, um, you know, that uh, that that line between uh, exploration and testing. Um, does exploring with data seem to you similar in some respects to the exploration that goes on, let's say, um, when someone's doing a more ethnographic style of research? Yeah, I do think it is. Um, you know, I'm I'm not trained in ethnography and I have never done an ethnography. So I'm inferring what people do when they do ethnography by reading ethnographies but not known for sure um i think um but i think sometimes i i especially looking at text data um i think of it as interviewing people in some sense right um which is we can look at these large trends using text data like we were kind of looking at this time series plot of these chinese twitter users but then we can also go and interrogate the data themselves by reading them. And a lot of what we discovered was actually just reading individual posts and that, that actually told us what was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I see, um, so I certainly have benefited from the individual data points, right? Um, even our, we're, we're doing a lot of work with Chinese court cases and reading individual court cases we've found to be very, or, or even taking our, what we find, um, um, in the data and asking judges about how they would interpret it, right, uh, can help us try to understand the data generating process in some sense, right, mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. the people and their incentives and then develop a theory from there. Um, so I think I, I see them go very um, hand in hand and both are probably very useful at that discovery phase. Great. Uh, so here's a question about your theoretical framework. Um, do you find that there's, you know, uh, a connection, let's say, between the work that all the studies that you've done, um, or are you more eclectic in your search for explanations? Um, I think I'm driven by a few questions or a few puzzles that um, really uh, just make me want to get up in the morning and do research. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One is, um, why does censorship affect people when it's circumventable? Um, that's a question that's kind of driven me for a long time. And I, so I, I always been looking for data sets that could help me answer that question. Um, another is um, what are government strategies for manipulating information and how are they responding to people's behavior? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I, that question just, just always makes me really interested. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, I think there are questions like, you know, I, there's some data sets that come across my desk that I don't find interesting because I don't think they can 
speak to, or I, my guess is that they can't speak to questions that I find that I'm, you know, really passionate about, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, certainly I, I think intellectually they're all related. <laughs> right. Right. Sure. Sure. Um, and do you, uh, feel that your research, uh, is related in some respects to your, your life, you know, your personal biography? Or is it more of an abstract intellectual endeavor? Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in some ways it's related. I mean, certainly I've spent a lot of time thinking about, um, uh, you know, I, as an undergraduate, I started studying Chinese when I was a freshman in college. And I... Um, and, like my, I guess my passions as an undergraduate were studying China and Chinese, which was so interesting and studying statistics. And so those were both things I found very interesting. Um, I guess I could use both of those trying to understand censorship and propaganda in China, especially I became really interested in machine learning as an undergraduate as well. Mm -hmm. Um so in some sense, I was like, that was the confluence of both of my academic interests. Um, right. But I think I've always been interested more generally in freedom of information. Um, and I'm certainly passionate about that as an issue, political issue. Um, and so I've always been motivated to um, study that issue in particular. Okay. Um, but I don't think it... Um, yeah. You, you've never been deprived of uh, the freedom to search for information in your life. It's not like yeah. something that... Well, you know, when you, as an undergraduate, you start going to China. I started going to China. And it's very interesting how, you know, um, at, at first in particular, I think I first went to China in 2005, 2006. And you realize that people consume very different types of information. And part of that's just language and um, another part of that is government information control. And so, you know, you start using your own efforts to circumvent these um, right. control. And then that becomes very, like, so, you know, you need to talk to your Chinese friends and, and see if they are doing that. And, and, and it becomes very interesting to know why or why not. And, um, and so I think that's how I kind of got started getting interested in circumvention of censorship and information control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, and and so my next question is about um, the role of serendipity, which we talk about, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, oh, this funny thing happened. And as a result of that, I, I wrote this paper. <laughs> uh, can you recall circumstances like that? Any funny stories? Um, <laughs> um, definitely. I think there's I mean, there's serendipity in every research project, right. I feel like. Right. Um, um, so I, I think um, part of, some of it's just getting access to the data that you've always wanted access to. Um, Gary and Jen and I wrote a paper on um, the 50 Cent Party um, in – uh, China, and we've all we always wanted to write on the Fifty Cent Party. This is on, this online, you know, people allegedly paid to spread online social media posts, and everybody had been talking about this for a long time. And to the so much that there were like jokes online about, oh, you're a Fifty Cent, or it's like mm -hmm. an insult that people throw around. And but we realized that the major impediment to studying this is that you have no ground truth data. So you know, you could say anybody's a Fifty Center, but you don't really know if they're. You know, and so then all of a sudden, this leaked data set of you know online propaganda posts came across our lap, and it was like, whoa, we get to study this, yeah. stuff, you know, and we get to, we, and and you know, we have no idea what they actually do, um, and so um, we just dove in, and, and the paper really was just a descriptive paper saying this is what they're talking about, um. It wasn't, there wasn't, uh, it was, it was, you know, really purely description um, and just, uh, you know, writing that down. Um, so uh, I think there's serendipity to just be coming across that data set. Absolutely. Cool. And, and um, when you are counseling uh, doctoral students or master students, 
who are looking for topics and maybe having a bit of a hard time, um, what sort of advice do you, do you give them? Um, I think that's so hard. You know, I always think of the movie Inception mm. and how you have this elaborate story of how people come up with ideas, yeah. you know, and it seems, I think this is the hardest part of the research process is coming up with a good question that, um, you know, um, it seems to me to be like an optimization strategy, right? Um, you have a certain set of skills, you have a certain availability of data, given those constraints, you're trying to answer the most important question that you can. And, um, and that's a hard optimization problem to solve. So, um, you know, I tell, I tell students to read the news, um, because I think, um, it helps people sort of ground themselves in questions that people find pressing, um, and important. And I tell students to, um, look for interesting approaches and, um, data sets that, um, you know, across disciplines, um, because sometimes I think, um, you know, we can answer questions in political science with methods or data that people are using in other disciplines, but we don't even know that those methods or data exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I mostly tell them, you know, um, you know, follow the things, the questions that get you up in the morning. Um, I wrote a, per, a initial perspective that was on a different topic and, I realized like it just didn't get me up in the morning to go, you know, I didn't want to work on that (laughs) when I was every morning and, and it just has to sustain you. And I think that's, um, I think that's really important. Right. Right. Good. Um, do you, when you look across the, you know, our discipline and you can see some people who are just in incredibly creative and productive and others who seem kind of stuck, um, is there, is there some ability, some capacity that, that people have to develop new and interesting ideas, new questions that others don't possess? Is there, is it a personality attribute? Is it, do you have any sense of what that is? That's a really good <laughs> question. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Let me think about this one. Um, I think I, I think it's I think it's hard to say because um, you know research questions there are a lot a lot of really important questions in some sense there are many more important questions than we have political mm-hmm. scientists to mm-hmm. study. Um, and I think one of the maybe frustrating things about the discipline is that um, there's a lot of sort of luck involved of the, those, the questions that are, you're passionate about are the ones that, pe- you know, people find important in that day and moment. Um, I feel like I've been very lucky in the sense is that people, you know, really care a lot right now about the spread of information and, you know, Chinese politics. Um but that, you know, I, I think those questions would have been interesting to me regardless of those factors. And so I, um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's some luck in, in which questions are trendy or which kind mm-hmm. of periods. Um, but I, but I do think that there are a lot of people doing really important work that's um, really interesting questions of creative approaches that may not be trendy now, but will tell us a lot about research. And, and, you know, one of the, the examples of this is the misinformation literature that, um, you know, there, there were a few people working on misinformation Mm -hmm. before 2016. And, and, um, and then all of a sudden their work became so relevant. Um, And I think, um, you know, in some sense, like following your gut and not the trend can be, Pan out so, later, so it's hard to say. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I said, right, so it's hard right, to say. Sure, I was yeah. just thinking uh, the rule of thumb is to find something terrible, study it, and wait until it happens on a massive scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> then you're the world's expert. Um, 
Right, right. So this uh, uh, something you said is sort of uh, segues into my into my final question. Um, you, you said, "Well, there are more questions than there are people to to uh, to answer them." Um, wh- what are the <laughs> or can, wh- what do you think of as being important but maybe underexplored areas of research? What what areas are ripe for discovery or rediscovery or um, what is your sense of things? Oh man, um, I think um, that's a that's a really yeah, question. Have easy <laughs> questions on the standardized survey. Th- these are the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think there's, um, I mean, I, I think I see the questions that are in my little corner of the discipline. And of course, there are many, many questions, I think, across the discipline that are really important to answer. Um, um, you know, in comparative politics, I think there are a lot of important areas of the world that we don't cover as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, that covering all of those those areas and understanding how these all of these big political science questions work out in those different areas is important. Um, I also think, I mean, I, I I'm very interested in technology and politics, and I think there, you know, it, it seems like we can never keep up with. Um, as political scientists, is very difficult to keep up. Um, so, um, if you think about questions of surveillance and politics, um, or um, um, the way that, um, you know, large amounts of data people are being used not only in commercial, but also crossing into political spheres. Um, I think these are questions that have huge implications for, um, the way that politics, the way that people interact with information and behave. And, um, you know, we're only beginning to figure out what's, um, we're only beginning to figure out what the implications are. And, and as, as we figure them out, new technology comes mm-hmm. out that has different implications. And so um, I, I think there's just, just a lot, a lot mm-hmm. to do there. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. Uh, well, I, I've run through my schedule of questions. What, can you think of other uh, issues that we haven't really touched on that, that uh, pertain to exploratory research and coming up with ideas? Um, no, no, I, I, I just think it's such an interesting, uh, topic. I'm really interested to hear your other podcasts, <laughs> <laughs> how other people think about this. It would give me some good ideas of, uh, you know, I think that those moments in your office with a student who's trying to come up with a dissertation topic are some of the most, you know, intellectually difficult um, and the fact that we don't think about, um, you know, how we do that, um, or be, maybe it's just because it's so, so hard is, is, uh, is interesting in itself. Yeah, it is. I was thinking about how, um, you know, my, I guess before I got involved with this project, I would, a student comes into my office and says, I don't know what to write my dissertation on, uh, or has some kind of very meandering thought process type of conversation, I would say, well, you know, come back when you have a research question. (laughs) That, that would have been my, that would have been my, my uh, response. And that I think is most people's responses, you know, like I can help you once you have a research question and a hypothesis, then we can sit down and we can do business. But, Um, yeah, all, uh, you know, 90% of good dissertations happen before you get to that point. And, and so it's really hard to know what, what to do, what to advise someone, or it's not even clear to me what I do because Mm -hmm. it's so, I guess once one has been in the business for a while, one thing leads to another and, and one is rarely sitting around thinking, what do I work on next? It's more like, which of the 12 projects that I've committed to am I going to work on right now, given that I'm behind on all of them? Um, but the, you know, the, there's a certain <laughs> kind of, um, but, but, which is a, an issue also that, that I, I think we end up becoming committed to projects that, that, you know, maybe are 
we shouldn't, you know, but just because they happened along our path and somebody said, oh, we should do this. And so art, right, sure, fine. It seems so easy. And then we don't realize that there are years that, yeah. uh, of our lives that are going to be sucked out. Um, so I, I wonder sometimes if even the people yeah. who are super busy and super productive are, are really making rational choices. And, and you, you termed it, I think, appropriately as an optimization problem. Are we really optimizing? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. I find that too, the sort of, we have to finish yeah. this paper because we started it. That's some cost fallacy, right? <laughs> <laughs> My fallacy is, is the tough one. Um, I mean, there are, I think there are moments when it's important for career reasons to do that. But, um, but I, yeah, I agree. You, you can lose your ears or your lives on projects. You maybe aren't, can't answer the questions you're necessarily, or, you know, yeah. yeah well, yeah. Hard. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. But, 